On ITV1, we celebrate some of your favourite TV. It was must-see. It's The Avengers. It was the swinging 60s when popular culture was being influenced by the music of the Beatles, the fashions of Carnaby Street, and in films and TV, secret agents. In 1962, I was playing a secret agent myself, starring alongside Bob Hope and Bing Crosby in a movie called The Road to Hong Kong. And Patrick McNee was dominating our television screens as John Steed in a stunning and groundbreaking series called The Avengers. Avengers was an adrenaline-charged, off-the-wall action-adventure series which became one of ITV's biggest ever hits. Every week, millions of loyal fans thrilled at the exploits of the debonair secret agent John Steed. With his trademark bowler and brolly, Steed would foil the diabolical plots of fiendish villains with more than a little help from his partners in crime-fighting, a succession of athletic, high-fashion, glamorous women. The first was Kathy Gale. Then along came Emma Peel, and then there was Tara King. Mother sent me. It did advance the cause of feminism, because up till then you had the odd bitch and the murderess, but you hadn't had a woman who was the equal of the man. Apart from me, you're the best driver I know. The Avengers created a surreal fantasy world all of its own. Everyone was upper class and lived a luxurious champagne lifestyle. You detect that heady aroma. Roses? Money. The sweet, sickly smell of money. The air's heavy with it. The ground is littered with millionaires. And awash with them. But it was all done with a knowing wink and with its tongue firmly in its cheek. Steed, is everything to scale? <laughs> it was an escapist world, a surreal world. It was like going into a painting, a surreal painting. It took you out of yourself. Now, shall I come up there or will you come down here? All right, all right! In the Avengers, nothing and no one was normal. From the top, if you please. Truby Homburg, a bowler cap. A jockey pork pie topper, boater Busby Fez. Bravo, excellent. It was pure entertainment. It was surprising at all times. And it was English. It was a beautiful England that everyone wants to know. It was sunny, people had wonderful things, wonderful cars, wonderful clothes, there were flowers. It was an ideal England. It wasn't the dark, grey, cold place that people think of. The Avengers lives and exists in its own world. No social problems, no family problems. The only thing that was spoiling it from time to time were uh, diabolical masterminds who were trying to take over the world. Soon I will have a trained force in every capital city of the world. And then a third world power will emerge. We will grow in strength. We will grind our enemies under our heel until there is one world power, the state of Natskyville. The plot sort of darted between the fantastic and the real with reckless abandon. And no attention was paid whatsoever to the fact that, that the plots were entirely wacky and mad and oddball. Six doors, Major Steed. One is harmless, but the other five.
Very clever. Very. Shut up. All the women looked beautiful, and all the, all the men were stylish and charming. Even the villains were charming. I refuse, absolutely. Then you are free to go. There's the door. I take it, gentlemen, you will be cooperating? It was gloriously over the top, but set against the bold new scientific developments of the 1960s, it all seemed strangely possible. Just about. This model looks remarkably accurate. It can drill holes in diamonds and goes through steel plate like butter. But as for living tissue, we should just have to experiment. Feeling more cooperative? No, I feel positively stubborn. I suppose, as, as distinct from, say, the James Bond canon, it was uh, sci-fi rather than spy-fi. What kind of formula? You take a teaspoonful at night and you wake up invisible. Invisible? It's a simple principle. You see, you see an object because it reflects light. Now, my formula absorbs light, no reflection, you can't see it. Uh, you kept a copy of the formula? Oh, naturally. But uh, whilst working on a nuclear device, uh, slight mishap. Boom! <laughs> <laughs> formula included. I'm afraid so. I yeah. thought so. The dialogue was crisp, funny, witty. You're supposed to throw him through a plate glass window. Why? Accepted agent's practice. You should always try, wherever possible, to toss your opponent through the nearest window. Double glazed, preferably. It's more effective and much more spectacular. The Avengers ran for nine years. And in that time, while production techniques evolved, and the girls came and went, Patrick McNee was a constant. He was the essential cornerstone of the entire Avengers phenomenon. He was a gentleman in all ways, actually. Patrick was very well cast. <laughs> Patrick played John Steed as the epitome of cool. Now you're here, why don't you stay for a drink? How the final character of Steed came about was due to Patrick. Patrick's father was a racehorse trainer and quite a dandy. Gadzooks and stap me vitals. And Patrick, realising that none of us had much idea of what the character of Steed was, built it for himself, but he modelled it on his father. Shrimp McNee, his name was. He was a tiny man with a big stomach full of gin, and he um, always dressed impeccably. The character of Steed developed actually through, through Patrick. That's very much his creation. I know that he based it in part on Q Planes, which starred Ralph Richardson. And he was playing a kind of secret agent. He carried an umbrella, wore a formal suit and a, and a Homburg hat. What is it? What's the matter? Tell her I'll ring her back in five minutes. Come along, come along. The significance of that uniform doesn't escape me, but I say to prance it on a man in his pyjamas... It... Oh. I see your point. I wore a bowler hat because I thought it was a nice thing to wear. I had an umbrella because it's a very useful weapon. And you carry an umbrella and nobody thinks you're in any trouble. <laughs> always be ready to kill. Patrick always gave a real, full-blown, wicked star performance of drama and charm and masculinity. I do admire you. A worthy adversary. Equally matched. We are very alike, you and I. Identical. Now, where's the difference? We are both dedicated to our country. We are both prepared to die for it. You have killed. I have killed. There is a difference. I kill when I have to. You, because you like it. <laughs> Nobody really knows who Steed was. He just emerged. He was needed. He was not a member of the police force. He was not... MI5, as far as anyone could tell. He worked for some mysterious secret organization. Your name crops up almost every day in training. We're taught the Steed method for this and the Steed method for that. No, no, that's not the way John Steed would have done it. Or well, yes, exactly. That's just how John Steed would do it. You've rather a reputation. In later episodes, we discovered that John Steed worked for a mysterious head of department called Mother. And naturally, this being the Avengers, Mother was a man. John! 
one that appeared in a variety of weird and wonderful places. In one episode, his office was on top of a bus. Sorry, full up. What do you mean, full up? Room for one more? But could we dispense with the jokes this morning? Thank you, Steve. Ah, oh, Rhonda, I'll have one of those. I'm very sorry. Trouble in Botswana? Trouble in abdomen. Too many oysters. Each week, I think people tuned in partly to see the show, but partly to see where we'd put Mother this time. You must appreciate my position. The Americans took to the Avengers in a big way. And I think, apart from the fact that it was well done and it was quite exciting and it was amusing, Steed fitted the common Midwestern image of the English dude. A tried and tested pick-me-up. They feel that the way Englishmen live is the way Steed lives. You know, with a beautiful girl on his arm and drinking brandy and champagne and never getting drunk. <laughs> I hope it's not against the rules. <laughs> Absolutely forbidden. But the glasses are over there. In the mid-60s, the series continued to push back the accepted boundaries of storytelling. But when Emma Peel went undercover as the Queen of Sin at the debauched Hellfire Club, whilst wearing nothing but black knee-length boots, a low-cut basque and a kinky collar, that's when the censors stepped in. Nineteen sixty six saw the Avengers fall foul of the censors in Britain and America. For one particular episode, A Touch of Brimstone, Diana Rigg designed the costume for Emma Peel's latest undercover mission herself. She was posing as the Queen of Sin at a modern-day Hellfire Club. She is yours to do with what you will. The producers got away with the outfit just, but the next scene was too much, and it was heavily cut. But here it is, the full original version. Now, what do you like for the big boys? <laughs> The show had come a long way from its first series when it was a straightforward, gritty and exclusively male thriller. The title of The Avengers came about because Ian Hendry was playing a doctor trying to avenge the death of his fiancée who had got caught up in a drugs thing. And he's helped by a mysterious man from the Ministry, John Steed, played by Patrick McNee. While well, we're on the subject of um, helping one another, Will you help me on that other little matter? Yes, when I have time. Certainly might be worth a shot, mightn't it? Hmm. I was his sidekick for a long time, and then he went off and became a movie star, and I was left all on my own. And they said, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, what do you think we could do? And they said, well, you could find somebody else. So I said, who? I said, well, shall we have a woman? A woman? At that time, there wasn't such a thing as a woman on television, you know? So we looked around and we found Honor Blackman. Steve, he could be sick. I mean, he carries great responsibility. You take my point. He's certainly under strain. What I mean is, medically, it might be wrong to assess his motive so categorically. Possibly. It's not my concern. Well, it should be. It's not my concern for the moment, Mrs. Gale. I want the Big Ben film, and I believe Steed knows where it is. Don't you? Yes, I suppose he must know. Honor was absolutely marvellous, because I'd always thought of her prior to working with the Avengers rather as the English rose type. Sweet and lovely and boring. <laughs> she really took to all the judo, all the physical stuff, with, with tremendous glee. I wonder whose friends they were. Not mine. She was the most unmale person I know. She was totally feminine. 
an extremely agile with the opposite sex and a delightful woman. Steed was always um, making advances towards Cathy Gale. And she always repelled him, but I think, uh, A, of course, she liked him very much, otherwise she wouldn't have been involved with all the work they did. And I think she was quite amused, you know, that he would keep trying. I've got a job. A job? Yes. You know, I'm very disappointed in you, Mrs. Vale. Oddly enough, my rent doesn't pay itself. I did suggest an alternative arrangement. It was rehearsed and then shot in one go. Excuse me. It was live, really. Oh. I think she's all right. Let's check. Hold on. So one ran from set to set, changing one's clothes and all the rest of it. This graveyard was built in the studio with an open grave. And Jackie Pallo, who was a wrestler, we fight and I have to put my foot in his face and kick. And we were both getting very tired. And when it got to that piece, I dried for a second and I went for the shovel. Instead of being nice and putting my foot on his face and kicking, I just kicked. And I split his nose right down and his eyes crossed. <laughs> and I don't know how, but he still remembered the next move and ran round and he fell in the grave. And he was out for seven and a half minutes. And I was walking around the grave sobbing, I'll never fight again. When, after two seasons, Honor decided to move on, the producers knew their next Avengers girl had to continue in the vein as Kathy's self-assured action woman. But this time they also wanted her to radiate even more in the way of man appeal. That's why they called her M Appeal. I wanted a slightly younger person, an unknown. And we tested a lot of young women. Uh, and of course, Diana Rigg was head and shoulders above them all. She just was so exceptional. She'd lighted on us like a butterfly on a flower, you know. Ah, oh, well, it'll be an OBE for me. Sir John Steve. Dame Emma. Well, Dame Diana Rigg, as she now is, is probably one of the best actresses in the world. She's played opposite almost all the top major actors. She's a very supreme actress and a perfectly darling person. Emma Peel brought with her a lighter touch, a jet-set attitude to life and stunning new, specially designed fashions. Oh, and she'd arrive behind the wheel of the latest open-top sports car. Suddenly, after 51 episodes, Diana dropped a bombshell. Despite earning two Best Actress Emmy nominations, she was quitting the hottest show on British television to return to the theatre. Mrs. Beale? We're waiting for you. Leaving the producers to find another headline-grabbing Avengers girl, the actress they chose to play Tara King was Linda Thorson. It was actually the first time, sort of in the history of any kind of series, where the leading character passes the baton over to the next leading character on screen. And uh, I have to say, I, lo I really love doing the episode, and I love the, you know, this most quoted line. He likes his tea stirred. anti clockwise I was just dead scared that I wasn't going to be accepted. And I did get a lot of hate mail. How dare you think you could take over from Diana Rigg? It was really awful and intimidating. Um, but I kind of carried on with great confidence. And when the show came on the air, people seemed to like Tara King. So I was very relieved. 
Tara, my Aunt Emily's battered, brassy, ancient alarm clock with one hand missing tells me that dawn approacheth. Oh. So it's Sammy kept our appointment with a good idea. Somebody 18 or 19 turns up looking like she did and you don't have any reaction? God, I should be sent to another planet. Tara, will you join me in my dark room? Etchings? Bromide papers. Going down. <laughs> Patrick was really delighted that I was so different and uh, I think quite... I mean, really immediately he saw that it was going to be very different for him. He was going to be a different John Steed because Tara King was in love with John Steed which was quite a change. And you never knew what their romantic relationship was. You never knew if she was making his tea because she'd just arrived in the morning or whether she'd been there all night. There's no hurry. Is there? None at all. And there was real violence, but it was handled in a fantastical way. We didn't have blood. <laughs> I always said that I want the impression that if we kill someone, that when we pan away, that someone, that actor, gets up, collects his paycheck and goes home. It's often dubbed a cult, a cult entertainment, a cult attraction, a cult fashion, and indeed it was. It goes on being popular, I think, quite honestly, because it's just very good. I really think it is good. There's nothing like it at all. And will there ever be again? There won't be another Pat McNee. Well, I've often been asked why The Avengers was so popular, and my answer always to this is because it was very good. I'll leave you to tidy up. It's one of the best shows that's ever been made. And that's my celebration of The Avengers, a truly unique, elegant and chic ITV series which more than deserves its place in television history. A fantasy world which surely could never exist today. Here's to honour Diana, Linda and, of course, Patrick, The Avengers. Next week's must-see TV looks back at one of the groundbreaking, technically innovative comedy series in the history of ITV, the naughty boy of comedy, Kenny Everett. That's after Doc Martin, next week at 10. And the laughs are on ITV4 right now as The Assistant continues, and here on ITV1 after the news with The Frank Skinner Show at 11.